Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be with you because I feel it's so important that we work across the Atlantic to come together to try to figure out how we can move this conflict onto the peace table. And before talking about that, we must acknowledge uh, how brutal this war is, condemn Russia for this invasion, uh, recognize the suffering of the Ukrainian people, the millions of refugees whose lives have been upended, uh, the civilians who are being killed, and the soldiers, because uh, let's face it, most of these soldiers uh, are young men. Uh, their lives are precious as well. They have families who love them. And every time one of them dies, uh, many people will be mourning for the rest of their lives. Um, and let's look at as well at the uh, brutality of the tactics that are being used now, especially in the cold of winter, uh, that the Russians are destroying the infrastructure that is leaving millions of Ukrainians without adequate heating, electricity, water uh, during these very cold months. So um, none of this is to justify the invasion. And we are constantly hearing in the news reports that this invasion is unjustified and unprovoked. I want to just make us very uh, clear in thinking about that this is unjustified, but it is indeed provoked. And it's important that we understand how it was provoked uh, and how the NATO countries played a role in getting to the point where we are today. Many people are uh, downplaying the importance of the expansion of NATO in creating the context for this. And I think that's very wrong. I think we have to recognize that this expansion of NATO was heralded uh, back in the 1990s as a historic mistake. And this was done by all kinds of policy experts, uh, academics, uh, diplomats, uh, who constantly for the last two decades have been saying uh, the US and the West should abide by the agreements they had with Gorbachev to not expand one inch eastward. And in our book, we quote many, many different sources back in the 1990s saying what a disaster this would be. We have 1997, 50 foreign policy experts saying that the expansion of NATO eastward is a policy era of historic proportions that would unsettle European stability. We have George Kennan, the intellectual father of the US containment policy with the Soviet Union during the Cold War, saying it is a tragic mistake. There is no reason for this whatsoever. No one was threatening anybody else. And then we have George Burns, uh, I mean, William Burns, who was a State Department official back in the 1990s, uh, in the embassy in Moscow. He reported hostility to early NATO expansion is almost universally felt across the domestic political spectrum. And I emphasize that one of William Burns because today he is the head of the CIA in the United States. He has warned time and time again against this NATO expansion. And now he's actually in a position where he's trying to contain uh, the very conflict that he predicted for so long. Um, the other thing is to recognize that NATO is not a defensive organization because that's something we hear over and over again in the media. NATO is an offensive, militarist, aggressive alliance that has shown its aggression over the years from the time of the uh, bombing of Kosovo, the involvement in the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan, of Libya. 
And now it has its sights set not just on Russia, but also on China. So let's be very clear that the expansion of this aggressive military hostile organization was certainly something that was extremely provocative in, uh, in, in Russia. The other thing I think that is important to understand in terms of the context of this is the involvement of the United States particularly during the 2014 uprising. The uprising, as we talk about in great deal detail in the book, was a popular uprising against an elected but corrupt government. And it was a mass uprising that turned from something peaceful into something that was hijacked to be a violent uprising uh, that you know, we can see uh, perhaps um, shades of that in the, uh, uh, what is just happening in Brazil right now. If you look at the mobs that went in and took over government buildings, uh, think of that happening during Minsk, where they, uh, I mean, during the um, uh, 2014 uprising of setting fire, destroying, uh, ransacking government buildings, uh, and turning that uprising into one that did not end in a negotiated settlement for new elections, as uh, many uh, were trying to do, but instead led to a coup. And when you look at the U.S. involvement in that coup, you see that for years, the U.S. had been putting millions of dollars into supporting anti-Russian organizations and had also been directly involved, as we see from the leaked audio tape of the Under Secretary of State Victoria Nuland when she was talking to the U.S. ambassador in Ukraine at the time, actually deciding who was going to be the next leader of Ukraine. And so when you see that the Minsk uh, uprising led to the breakaway republics in Donbass and the civil war that went on there for years, led to the Russians taking over Crimea, um, it's important to understand the context of a government that was a pro-Russia government being overthrown and a pro-Western government putting being put in with the help, uh, the aiding and abetting of outside forces. Uh, the Minsk agreement, which was a very important effort, not only between Ukraine and Russia, but with uh, European forces and the support of the Security Council to find a way to calm down that crisis um, was then also hijacked and that it was not implemented. The political part of that agreement was never implemented by the Ukrainians, uh, who even if they wanted to, like in the case of Zelensky when he first came in having run as a peace uh, candidate, um, was threatened by the uh, neo-Nazis that he would be hanging from a tree if indeed he met with the leaders of the, uh, uh, of the breakaway republics. And some of you might have seen the quite recent interview uh, that was done by Angela Merkel uh, in one of the German newspapers in which she said that the Minsk agreement uh, really was a way to buy time for Ukraine and that Ukraine today uh, was not like Ukraine was in uh, 2015 because it has had the time to build up its um, military and to be uh, to get all of this weaponry from the West. And uh, indeed, uh, she basically admitted that the Minsk agreement was not really meant to be implemented. Um, it was meant to uh, give Ukraine the time it needed with the help of the West who came in and started pouring weapons into Ukraine and training 10,000 members of the military per year um, so that it would be ready for a war with Russia. Uh, the um, jumping up to today, uh, so we have a well-armed Ukrainian military that is getting tens of billions of arms from the West. 
just in the United States alone, it's over $60 billion worth of weapons that have gone uh, since the war, uh, since the Russian invasion in February. Uh, and that's not counting all the money that's going economically to Ukraine, and that's only from the United States. Uh, and of course, Russia has a well-developed military. And so you have these two heavily armed forces. Uh, now, there is a myth out there in a lot of the mainstream media and from some politicians that Ukraine is able to win this war. And by winning the war, meaning they're able to recover every inch of territory uh, that uh, Russia or Russian supporters have taken since 2014. And um, that uh, idea, including Crimea, uh, is something that is echoed by many of the leaders, including uh, until recently, the Biden administration. And yet we have a different narrative uh, that we are hearing from inside the military, inside the military in the US and inside the militaries of some of the Western countries. Uh, and that is exemplified by the US chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which is the number one military advisor to President Biden, who came out just about a month ago and said, the Ukrainians have done an incredible job fighting back against Russia, but they uh, basically have come to a stalemate and a military victory is not likely. He said, now during the winter time is a good time to seize the moment to go to the negotiating table. This same kind of language has been voiced by other members of the military, as well as other people uh, in the militaries in Western countries. And there was a recent interview that the head of NATO, Jen Stoltenberg gave, um, where he was asked, what is his greatest fear for the winter? And he said his greatest fear was that this conflict could spin out of control. And if it went wrong, it could go terribly wrong, meaning that he understands uh, that this could spin out of control and become indeed a nuclear war. Uh, military leaders understand uh, that the Russian uh, government is not about to uh, ever declare defeat and just leave, that they do have nuclear weapons and that if pushed into a corner, um, could potentially use those weapons. We heard a warning of that back in the 1962 missile crisis from John F. Kennedy, when he said a year after having negotiated with Khrushchev and made a compromise with him that the, uh, the, the Russians would take their uh, weapons out of Cuba if the US would take its nuclear weapons out, uh, away from Turkey, something that wasn't told to the American people at the time. But JF Kennedy said, if you're in a fight with a nuclear power, never put them in the position where they have to choose between a humiliating retreat or the use of nuclear weapons. And I think that people in the militaries of the Western powers and in NATO understand um, that this is not a good idea, which is why even President Biden voiced the need for, quote, an off ramp. Uh, there is no winning in this war. And that's something we have to repeat to people time and time again, because then the question is, all right, well, what do we do then? It's not about throwing more and more weapons. Uh, that will only keep the conflict going and escalate the conflict and increase the risk that there will be uh, a uh, spillover into a NATO country in which then all of the NATO countries, according to Article 5, would feel obligated to get even more deeply involved militarily uh, and uh, escalating out of control. So that it means that the only possibility for the of the future without going to nuclear war is negotiations. But people say, well, you can't negotiate with Putin. 
And I think there we have to stop and say, one, it's the only option because whether we like it or not, he's the one in power. Two, let's try negotiations and see where it goes. There were negotiations that were started back in March, right after the war began. And actually, uh, they were there was great potential there. Both sides said there was potential. They were coming up with a peace plan. And, uh, and then it was in early April that Boris Johnson showed up and stymied or torpedoed uh, this whole peace effort by saying uh, that the uh, that Zelensky should not negotiate a peace plan, that the collective West uh, was in this uh, in for the long run, and that they would not be supporting negotiations, uh, but that they would be supporting uh, the the fight that um, until quote victory. This was echoed uh, in a similar way by the U.S. Secretary of Defense Boris uh, uh, Lloyd Austin, who came in and said. Uh, that we had to use this fight as a way to weaken Russia so that it could not be able to do this again. Well, there were peace talks, the ones that were being negotiated by Erdogan in Turkey, uh, and they were then cut off. Um, can talks be started up again? Uh, I, I think there are some examples to show that there have been talks on very limited issues. For example, there have been numerous talks uh, for uh, prisoner swaps. In fact, the latest one was just uh, yesterday. Uh, and the one before that was December 31st. There have been probably about two dozen prisoner swaps. And imagine the intense negotiations that have to go on to decide who is going to be swapped for whom and the logistics and the trust that has to be built up to make that happen. There have been negotiations on the grain deal to get over 10 million tons of grain out of Ukraine into the world market to help uh, ease the shortages of grain and the inflation that that has caused. Uh, there have been negotiations when it looked like the Zaporizhia nuclear plant was about to be blown up to get the International Atomic Energy Association uh, into that plant and try to uh, ease the uh, pressure there. Um, but there need to be talks that are on the entire issue of uh, the future of Donbass, the future of Crimea, uh, getting Russian troops out, and neutrality for uh, Ukraine, because that will be essential for any kind of negotiations. Um, I think there is some positive movement in, the, uh, in this issue towards negotiations from the fact that we hear some changes in the way that um, some members of the Biden administration and even in the UK are talking about this. And I wanted to read a couple of things that came out very recently uh, that show this, because in the past, uh, the um, narrative has been that nothing for Ukraine without Ukraine, meaning that uh, the U.S. will not talk to its counterparts in Russia, uh, and also uh, the maximalist position, both on the Russian side, that um, this uh, the sham referendums that they had in the four regions meant that they were, quote, part of Russia, uh, as one maximalist position on the Russian side, and the other side, the Ukrainians, we want every inch back since 2014, what we're hearing is something a little different right now. So on December 5th, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken came out and said, the goal of the war is now to, quote, take back territory that's been seized from Ukraine since February 24th. Um, it, uh, the Wall Street Journal also quoted two European diplomats that said that the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, recommended that Zelensky's team start thinking about its realistic demands and priorities, including a reconsideration of its stated aim for Ukraine to regain Crimea. Um, we also have the fact that um, the one of the first actions of your own prime minister, Rishi Sunak, 
was to have the defense minister, Ben Wallace, call the Russian defense minister for the first time since the Russian invasion uh, to try to, quote, de-escalate the conflict, which is, of course, a significant shift from the policies of Boris Johnson and Liz Truss. Um, what I'm saying here is it sounds like what they're saying now is not that we have to go back to the pre-2014 borders, but to the pre-February 24th, 2022 borders. Um, this is very important if it um, looks like indeed uh, there could be negotiations uh, that could lead to some kind of uh, uh, ceasefire and peace talks. So I wanted in my last few minutes just to say where things are in terms of the US political scene. While we might see a softening of the discourse uh, from some of the uh, people in the Biden administration, we see a very hard line coming from the US Congress that has been giving over massive amounts of money to Ukraine, that had Zelensky come and meet with a joint session of Congress, gave him 18 standing ovations, um, especially every time he talked about victory. And again, his version of victory is clawing back every single inch of territory. Um, and uh, so Congress is really very hawkish both the Republicans and the Democratic Party. There were some uh, 30 members of the Progressive Caucus of the Democratic Party that wrote a letter to Biden uh, calling for negotiations, and they were so pilloried by members of their own party that within 24 hours, they withdrew that, and only one member of the entire Democratic Party in Congress is willing to talk about negotiations, which I find totally uh, incredible. On the other hand, in the Republican Party, we do have about 50 or 60 members of that party that have been questioning what they call a blank check for Ukraine and have said once they are in power, and now they are in power in the House, um, they will start uh, hearings that will look at where all this money is going, try to have an audit of where it's going, uh, and that they want a much more robust discussion about U.S. policy and where it is headed. Uh, some of these are the most extreme right-wing members of Congress, which makes it very difficult for organizations like mine to try to find who are indeed our allies in the U.S. Congress right now, because things are so topsy-turvy. But I know we're coming up now to the um, half hour here, and I want to make sure we have plenty of time for discussion. So let me just say uh, that this is one of the most difficult conflicts in terms of a U.S. peace uh, movement. One, we don't have much of a movement. Uh, the movement we had during the Iraq war when we were able to get hundreds of thousands of people on the street does not exist now for a number of reasons. One, the Russians being the number one aggressor in this conflict, uh, but also because it's a Democrat in the White House and many people don't want to come out second guessing a Democratic president. Um, and third is that they have been pumped for many years now uh, since the election of Donald Trump uh, to believe that the Russians were responsible for the Democrats losing what we call Russiagate in this country. And so there are many millions of Democrats who are already uh, uh, primed to be hating Russia, and this only reinforces their reasoning. Uh, we can get into more issues about that, but the fact of the matter is it's very, very difficult to organize uh, significant demonstrations. We have a coalition called Peace in Ukraine. We get together, we do uh, small demonstrations, we pressure our uh, members of Congress, um, but we are finding now uh, that the ones who might be able to bring out more in terms of numbers of people are not the progressives, but the um, uh, more uh, groups like the Libertarian Party 
Uh, some people don't want to make alliances with them for uh, not being on the same page on other social issues. Uh, this is just to say it's difficult to figure out who our allies are, how we can build up the kind of strength we need to put the pressure on our government. And all of this is to lead to a conclusion that we have to work together with the Europeans, not only you in the UK, but those in places like um, like Italy, uh, in uh, Germany, and the Czech Republic that have been able to get tens of thousands of people out on the streets. So I look forward to figuring out together how we can be much more effective uh, in pressing as the collective West, not the collective West that Boris Johnson talked about, that was a collective West that wants to see this war go on and on, um, but the collective West that wants to end the killing, end the suffering, and see how we can have a, indeed a new European security architecture that would allow all of us to live in peace. Thank you.